Hello everyone, welcome back to Military Aviation History. I'm your host Bismarck and today we are going to talk about German flak, specifically the fabled 88, known to the Germans as the 8-8 or 8 cm Flugabwehrkanone 18, 36, 37, 41, depending on what version we are dealing with. Chances are that you are familiar with those images of Allied bomber streams over Europe being exposed to a barrage of AA fire, each puff in the sky translating into a compact high explosive package, courtesy of the Luftwaffe. And yes, the Luftwaffe did indeed control most AA units in Germany. What I want to do today is talk about the actual effectiveness of flak, because depending on whom you ask, you might either be told that German flak was best flak or that it was a waste of time. To assist me in this, I once again went out and got a whole bunch of primary sources that I have here with me, as I tend to do. And not only will these give us plenty of data, but I think they are also quite revealing. My sources are, as always, in the description down below. Now, the German company Krupp started designing the 88 in the late 1920s, using the 18 in the flak's name as a cover, pretending it was of World War I origin in reference to the flak 16. Of course, this was a violation of the Treaty of Versailles, but what you gonna do about it? Ironically, that treaty is actually one of the reasons why this gun came to be in the first place. During the late 1920s and mid-1930s, the bomber was projected to reign supreme in the sky. Germany, due to Versailles, was unable to develop high-performance aircraft such as fighters, mainly due to the restriction in engine development and production. So they needed something to take on that bomber, and the 88 was set to step into exactly that role. Designed to be the next best thing in the realm of heavy AA, able to lob large caliber shells at high-flying enemy targets, it presented itself as the backbone of German ground-based air defense. The gun itself, as the name implies, shot an 88mm shell with a high muzzle velocity and a high effective firing ceiling. As in its AA role, the 88 only shot into the general postcode of the enemy bomber stream without much aiming, it could theoretically achieve a rate of around 20 rounds per minute with a good crew. However, due to ammunition consumption, this was sometimes artificially decreased by the operators. The gun was equipped with a variety of different shells, but in its AA role, we will have a look at a standard HE shell only. The Sprenggranate L45 constitutes the primary HE shell used by Germany. While a contact fuse did exist, time fuses for AA fire were preferred. The Zeitzünder S30 was used, either with a spring wound or an inertia operated mechanical time fuse operating at 30 seconds. Initially, they had to be set by hand, later an automatic system would be used. These time fuses are important, do remember them for later on. Now the shells contain an explosive charge of 0.7 to 0.9 kilograms of TNT or Amatol on a 40-60 ratio, sending out destructive shrapnel from the casing. If you want to know about the AP shells and the 88 in its anti-tank role, be sure to check out MHV video after this one. The Germans organized their 88s in batteries of 4 or in Großbatterien of 12. The latter were somewhat rare. Around cities, such batteries would be collected in both regiments and divisions. For example, at its high point in 1944, the Erste Flak Division covering Berlin had around 104 heavy flak batteries, predominantly consisting of 88s. Now you can do the math on how many barrels were pointing skywards back then. As mentioned, a battery consisted of usually four guns. Attached to this was a flak commando gerät, one auxiliary commando gerät, and a radio. The commando gerät, with its telescopic rangefinder, was the principal fire direction device, updating the flak guns on the heading, range, and altitude of the incoming bombers. Later on, the commando gerät would also supply this information to an automatic Zünderstellmaschine that would set the time delay fuses of the individual shells based on the transmitted variables. With the advances made in flak defenses, the information of the commando grade was actually quite critical because it would allow the gun aimers of each individual 88 to simply follow the transmitted instructions to keep track of the bomber formation without an actual need to spot the individual targets. I found one interesting document from 1944 uh, giving the guidelines, well, the Richtlinien of the Vierte Flak Division covering the area around Düsseldorf in the Ruhr. I'll be focusing on daytime operations only here. 
Now batteries were instructed to fire only at targets over 5,000 meters at an angle greater than 340 degrees. And for targets below 5,000 meters, an angle of 30 degrees would be used. This gave each battery a limited time to send out their regards, typically around well, 10 to 12 minutes. The leading centered element would be targeted continuously by the guns until they are forced to switch to a new target once the bombers have either passed out of range or have dropped their payload. And the guns would consistently aim ahead of the advancing bomber stream. This makes sense since obviously the shells needed about 25 to 30 seconds to reach the altitude. The Germans differentiated between two types, main types of fire, gezieltes Feuer and Sperrfeuer. The former constitutes continuous fire by the guns based on the tracking data supplied by the commando gerät. It was generally the most accurate. Beyond that you have Sperrfeuer, which is uh, breaking down into bewegliche Sperrfeuer and Sektor Sperrfeuer. Now I'm not 100% sure what is meant with bewegliche Sperrfeuer since I couldn't find an actual source in an original German document explaining it, but given the context that it is being used in, I would think that this is a shifting barrage, providing short, concentrated clusters of explosions while jumping from one location to the next on the bomber's fly path. Sector Sperrfeuer, on the other hand, would be a concentrated and unmoving sector in the sky, constantly barraged by the guns. Beyond that, the German differentiated between a couple of other types of fire, Schwerfeuer hoch, Zwischensperrfeuer and Mosquito Schwerfeuer. Now based on their names, I could of course now assume what they mean, but sometimes the obvious answer isn't the correct one. And since I don't have an original source explaining these, I don't want to go out on a limb here and give you guys the wrong idea. So that's a project for another time. Moving on, how did the German 88s damage or shoot down Allied bombers? Do you remember the time fuses from early on? This is where we turn back to those. Since these shells operated on a time delay fuse, they did not explode on contact with the bomber. This is why sometimes you see pictures like this one showing damage caused by a shell going clean through the plane's structure without exploding. Now, if one of them went off in immediate proximity to the aircraft or got in himmel inside one, you'd get something like this. There are quite a few of these pictures out there from returning aircraft giving credit to the plane's construction, but usually those kinds of hits were fatal. It's just that you don't see those pictures because the planes, well, they're gone. In any case, it was far more likely that shrapnel from an explosion close to the aircraft would cause damage to both ship and crew. How close? Well, we will find out with these primary sources. The first thing we will look at is how an 88 would actually explode. This is important because the directional fragmentation density emitted from an explosion is quite distinct in an open space. It wasn't equal all round and there is a pattern to it. In static tests it was found that the standardized trends of 88 shells in the fragmentation is an extension of 0 to 30 degrees of the horizontal. Keep in mind that this is a 2D representation of an actual 3D event. Shells would be fired at all sorts of angles, meaning that the composite burst patterns might be very different. The randomness is impossible. In any case, we can assume that while the composite burst patterns aren't always the same, they hold concentrated zones. About 70% of all shells were concentrated within the main fragmentation areas, and that 60% of all the shrapnel remained clustered within 10 feet or 3 meters from the exploded shell before expanding outward further. We can thus assume that this distance is where the ADH shell would be at its most destructive as it sends out shrapnel in a concentrated cluster before the velocity and concentration of the shrapnel decreases with the distance. Now this also correlates somewhat with the accounts of crew members uh, from these bombers who said that if you can just spot a puff of smoke in the sky, you were usually safe, but if you saw the actual explosion right in front of you, you were probably too close. There is an interesting study comparing the hits on B-17s and B-24s. In this paper right here, we've got a breakdown of flak damage to both aircraft, roughly 3,000 B-17s and 900 B-24s, returning to their UK bases in July 1944. The study in question shows the percentage of hits to the top, bottom, and sides calculated as per square foot per 1000 aircraft. There are two important factors here. First off, these values might be skewed because of survivor bias. The ratio here is from planes that made it back 
not including those enjoying an extended holiday in the German countryside. The report does take this into account, saying that, where are we? There we go. The deficiencies of hits on bottoms of fuselages, as shown by decreases in the ratio of top to bottom hits for both types of aircraft, may be regarded as hits sustained by missing in action aircraft. Quote end. Second, the relative variation in hits between the aircraft might also be to the respective aircraft dimension. The B-17 has a 25% greater bottom surface, while the B-24 has a 36% greater lateral surface. Now, per 100 hits, there would be 34 casualties in B-17s, but only 19 in B-24s. The hypothesis here is that because the B-17 has a larger horizontal profile, crews and critical systems are at a comparatively higher risk. Yet the loss ratio of both aircraft was the same. This would suggest that for similar hits, B-17s were more likely to return than B-24s, be it with more casualties aboard. There is another study that is of interest to our needs, the Survey of Battle Casualties, 8th Air Force, June, July, August 1944. Remember our old friend, survivor bias, only those that come back can be analyzed. The study looked at the casualty rate of 40 different heavy bombardment groups, flying either B-17s or B-24s, or a mix thereof. The data pool consisted of 944 damaged but returned aircraft with 1,117 casualties. Before we continue, the word casualty includes both wounded in action and KIAs in the report, so I'll be doing the same for the sake of consistency. These casualties had three causes, flak, fighter and secondary missiles, like fragments of plexiglass for example. The overwhelming majority of cases are from flak. 86%, translating to 963 casualties, separated into wounded and KIAs. I'll be using two colors to separate those, uh, white for wounded and red for the KIAs. Here we have now a breakdown of the casualties across all cruise stations. And you'll see some interesting trends. First off, you have the waste gunners, and they are quite a distinct outlier. The study explains this, and I quote, the high casualty rate for waste gunners was partially due to the fact that heavy bombers frequently carried two waste gunners. Quote, end. Second of all, we have quite a high casualty rate for the navigator and the bomber deer. And this is most likely due to the unprotected nature of the bomber's nose. The ball turret gunner itself has a low ratio, as the study actually mentioned that most of the time this position was not occupied. Also, the co-pilot seems to have been a bit luckier than the actual pilot. Now, you might have noticed that if we uh, break down the aircraft into its compartments, you'll see that the casualty rates are very consistent within these, hinting to the relative protection of each. These studies go one step further and they actually analyze what sort of wounds the crew sustains and, well, the chances of survival. If you've ever looked in a mirror, chances are you have, you'll have realized that your head represents a smaller target than, well, say your chest. Uh, it has a smaller surface area all around, also for the chest. Based on such body surface area ratios, the Air Force expected to have the following hit ratios on men hit by flak. The ratio based on body surface area in all wounded cases it actually got was the following. And here is the ratio for all KIAs. And as you can see, there is a marked difference between the expected wounds based on the body surface area of the chest and abdomen. This is important and I'll, I'll touch on it again later on, so do remember it. So while this was based on the ratio of wounds based on the uh, body surface area, what was the actual percentage breakdown between wounded and killed personnel? Let's have a look at that. Again, we have an interesting outlier, the chest and abdomen. What's going on? This is where our friend the Flyers West comes into play. Sometimes known as flag vests, these were protective covers worn by American bomber crews meant to absorb some of the flak's shrapnel. But how can we judge the effectiveness of armor? 
The study admits that this is a problem, and I quote, it, it has been impossible to calculate accurate data to show the incidence of personnel hit but uninjured by flak in the regions of the body protected by armor. And to solve this, and I quote, an evaluation of the protection offered by armor may be obtained from a study of the quantitative relationship between flak hits and projected body surface areas. To turn back to the numbers then of the expected hits based on body surface area, told you this was important, so I do hope that you remembered it. Here's a little bit of a refresher. Um, here is the actual hit ratio observed based on body surfaces in all casualties. We've got 60% less than expected chest hits and 80% less than expected abdomen hits. Obviously, to compensate, the relative average of other areas went up. This is then following a study that was made comparing the actual wounds of personnel wearing armor and those that didn't. And boom, yes, go science, we have a ratio that is once again telling. Chest and abdomen hits went down, but what about head wounds then? Again, a small study was conducted between the majority of crew members wearing a helmet and the courageous few that didn't. Now in the study, a head wound is a wound from the neck up. Before we go into this, however, please observe that the paper does tell us that the sample of data was not sufficient to give statistical significance. The percentage breakdown between unprotected and protected total wounds and fatal wounds is the following. You'll see that the head wounds were fatal in 77% of cases when the crew member did not wear a helmet and 58% in those cases when they did. That's a near 20% reduction in fatalities. We can assume that the vast majority of the 58% of fatal wounds in the protected cases did not take place in the space protected by the helmet, but were from the front or especially into the neck. Having gone through this data, you might now say, well, that's all very good, but how many bombers were actually lost your flag? Sticking with the Americans here, just for the sake of consistency, the Air Force's statistical digest suggests that over Europe between August 42 and May 45, 2,450 heavy bombers were lost to fighters, and 2,439 to AA. So you might think the Flyboys got this one in the back, but in 1944 things looked very equal, but after the Luftwaffe committed death by Bodenplatte in 1945, suddenly the majority of kills were of course done by the flak. Now there is a discussion to be had here, because while Germans flak expended an ungodly amount of ammunition to achieve these numbers, it does suggest itself to be as much an asset as interceptors. German flak defenses throughout World War II and by 1944 were probably the best ground-based air defenses in the world. Not just because practice makes perfect and the German gunners had a lot of practice, but also because the organization behind it was sophisticated. Combine that with the relative uh, ease of training, flak crews, the psychological impact of AA barrages, which I haven't touched upon, and the disruptive effect of these, German flak does seem to fulfill its role to the extent that it could. So I hope that you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please consider supporting us on Patreon, earn some little perks with that as well, and as always, please do share our videos. And as always, I wish you guys a great day, good hunting, and see you in the sky.